For the sake of time, let's so that we have another drug. Uh, so larotrectinib uh, has come on as the first approved, but there's another drug um, that that is moving quickly. Um, uh, intractinib. Um, so, yeah. Philip, you want to talk a little bit about intractinib? Yeah, there, there was a study presented by George Dimitri in 2018, ESMO, and this was uh, in 54 patients again with the 10, mal uh, 10 malignancies and ni 19 histological types. It was. Um, uh, it was a study done globally, and there were 54 patients. And in that trial also, they found um, a response rate of over 50%, a bit lower than what uh, Ed was talking about in terms of the, um, the other drug. And, um, and, and side effects were tolerable. The difference with this drug and, and, uh, and, uh, and larolectinib is that it, it may cross the blood-brain barrier, blood -brain barrier. And um, that might be an advantage in patients who have uh, CNS metastases, but I don't know if if that was also tested in the previous trial. There will be and an update analysis on the layer that, So CNS that will be something which we'll be looking for. And uh, only uh, a handful of patients had to stop the treatment because toxicity, again, well tolerated. The difference is it's not very, it's only specific to the uh, Entrac uh, fusion uh, changes. So again, even with that, it's not really showing any major increase in the side effects. So that goes with the idea that, it, in fact, it may not be that much different, but also as helpful. The response rate is less, but I don't know if we can make any real comparisons between the two, because they're separate studies. Yeah. And, um, and there was a good duration of response, which was over 10 months, and survival was, at the time of the presentation, the median was 20 months. So overall, we're still waiting for an update on the trial, but certainly uh, another drug which may show uh, a good promise in this disease, in this class of agents. Well, I want you all to get out your crystal balls. Um, let's say intractinib gets approved. Um, so let's go even back to that. I was sitting here thinking, what if we were the panel for the FDA? Yeah. And, and and is it basically meeting the same bar yeah. that was the previous? And are there, you know, do you, what, what's the FDA's role in kind of governing how many products in a similar space? and and all of that, and that, that, you know, I think the FDA would say, well, we're objective and we're gonna yeah. approve this drug. So I, I get where you're going, but yeah. it's a challenge. It's, it's a challenge, I, I agree. It's a, it's, a, it's a rare genotype. The response rates are a little bit lower than we see with the Laro data. I, I, I'm not the FDA, so I don't know how these decisions are really made. Does the ROS1 activity excite the lung people? Well, we actually found this, the Star Trek trial a little more attractive because it had both ROS1 as well as ALK uh, Coverage. Now, again, that might compromise some of the activity that we're seeing with TRAC. You know, it's still early, 55 patients. Gosh, you put 10 more on, it could change to 80%. But uh, uh, that, that was a somewhat attractive to us uh, why we... The drug doesn't work uh, in the crizotinib refractory setting for ROS1, though. So it's more for the, the, the crizotinib naive, uh, and it has response rates north of 65 70%. We see a response rate in the intract fusions around 50 Back to your question, John, I, you know, I, it's interesting. It puts the FDA in a difficult decision here for how crowded is this space going to be when you've got one drug that's come along with a response rate of 75% has been the darling trout of the tissue agnostic space. Um, does this drug then come in and get approved? Let's say it does get approved. I mean, is this, do we feel like this is something we would try? Is it a sequencing then? We don't have a lot of data on sequencing for these drugs. I, I'm kind of a capitalist type of person, so <laughs> uh, you know, I like for the market to play out uh, with competition. So I think it's, it's always good when you're always one of the first few drugs, you kind of get that exception and you come in. Uh, but although now, you know, in renal cell and others, we're seeing like the seventh drug and the fifth uh, IO. And so, you know, I, I think uh, that we talk about cost we, and, and the way prices of drugs go up despite no new indications and no other things. I think this hopefully leads to check and balance and the market will play out. I mean, we, we're, the, we're the docs. You know, we, we know what we feel comfortable with. There are some side effect differences between the two drugs. Uh, you know, there could be activity. So uh, it, it's happened in the ALK space where certain drugs get zero percent market share and others get a lot. We so. know some of those drugs in the ALK space. That's right. So yeah. it's, uh, but when you say the market, like sometimes, yes, the market and the doctors and that experience, some will say, well, I treat so many patients with uh, panitumumab, so many patients with cetuximab, but I can see a difference or something. But in this situation, it will be difficult because people will not have that sort of 
experience saying, I like this blood pressure medication, I don't like that blood pressure medication, mm -hmm. because it's a rare situation. It, it might come down to formularies, Phil, right? Yeah. And then it yeah. would be cost. So yeah. at least yeah. that would be a benefit. Exactly. You know, if you said I could get Laro at 10 or 10,000 or Entrectimib at five, you know, there, there maybe sure. that's what so it comes that down would be to. So that may be a major you know? player, yes. Right. The question also would be, are they in the same space? If we don't have data for what happens for refractory patients or patients who require resistance, then there could be a harm done. So if you're going to give them, if you're going to sequence them when there really shouldn't be sequenced, then that would be my worry. Until we have more data about sequencing, I do worry that people will end up using both, which may not be the right answer, and I think it's too early to tell. And there is some data coming out about the um, resistant mutations, and of yeah. course that was the reason why they have LOXA-195. So right. LOXA-195 being particularly for the people who are developing resistance. The interesting thing is there haven't been that many of them yet. Right. Um, and so that's a good thing. It's not necessarily good yeah. for LOXA-195. I remember but. hearing about that study and I was talking to one of the company folks. I'm like, is that going to be like two patients in the next <laughs> like yeah. five years? I think that's actually how many. It's like two or three. It's, right. They're not that many. Right. And um, I think that that's going to be, I, I was like, well, do I, I guess we don't need to open that study. <laughs> for like five years, yeah. you know, like it's in, even just doing the study is actually. I applaud them for it's having yeah. 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 Well, it's something yes. we need yeah. to know. I mean, it's, well, then the question yeah. is, should you be giving that in the first line if it really is everything with, you know, that Laro does plus one more? Like yeah. maybe we should start with that. And, it's yeah. just and then it could, can lead to another mutation. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that the mechanisms of resistance are starting to be sorted out within before you even have yeah. before you even have the drug come out, yeah. which is so we see these solvent front mutations. I love that. We that. see an alkyl. I love it. That makes me crazy too. Um, I love it.